Good morning, everyone. Those of you who are in the hall and those of you who are on Zoom for this meeting, we're very privileged today to have Professor John Compton uh, speaking to us on the topic of the West Coast origins of human life on the West Coast. As you will hear the moment he starts to speak, he is of American origin uh, from the San Francisco Bay area of the United States. However, having come from the far west, he went to the far east for his education uh, and ended up with a degree from Harvard University on the other side of the continent. He taught at the University of Marine Science in South Florida, but in 1996 decided to move to South Africa and took a position at the University of Cape Town, where he has been based ever since. Uh, he taught in the Department of Geological Sciences originally, and then moved on to the Earth and Environmental Sciences. He has published a number of books, some of which are available here today. He has published four books and many articles on the topics of geology and human origins in the Cape Town area. Uh, he is now a professor emeritus at the University of Cape Town, and he continues his work and his research on various projects, and he publishes books in the natural history field. He is going to speak to us today, particularly on the West Coast. John, we're very pleased to have you here. Thanks for coming all the way from Cape Town and speaking to us live. And as you know, this is going out on Zoom to a number of other people as well. So thank you very much, over to you. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. So it's great to be here, and uh, it's great that it's an integrated uh, system so those can have it and it'll be recorded. One of the things I have found as an advantage to the Zoom presentations is, of course, they are recorded. And in fact, um, if you're interested in, in hearing other talks I've given, you can visit my website and I provide their links to the archive talks on other topics. So uh, if you are interested or keen, you can learn more from those. Right, so for today, uh, I wanna to try to give you a bit of a sense of the history of the West Coast from the British arrival here up through to what we call the Anthropocene, okay? And maybe you've heard of that term Anthropocene before. It's become quite popular in the press. Uh, and basically it means human epoch. And I'll give you a little more detail on that just now. And it's the focus of the third chapter in my new book, my latest book, The West Coast of Natural History. So the book is in three parts. And in the first part, it's sort of about the physical environment of the West Coast. And the second one, the second chapter is sort of about the living landscape, what lives in that physical environment. And the third chapter, this one, is called West Coast Redefined in the sense of how humans, how human activities, how we in our daily lives have basically transformed much of the West Coast. That'll be the topic of this morning's talk. The big transformations on the West Coast really were initiated with the arrival of the British. And many of you may have heard, may be familiar with the Battle of Bloberg in 1806. It's when the British formally came in by force and took over the Cape from the Dutch. And the British, of course, were bringing with them the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution had its origins in the British Isles. And as a consequence of the ability to tap fossil fuel energy, basically burning of coal, and the development of cheap steel to be able to to produce cheap steel, those were the two fundamental features of the, of the Industrial Revolution. And so there's a painting depicting the battle at Bloberg. You can actually go and visit the battleground site. There's a guy named Dave Honor who runs a field trip there, quite interesting. And that's Bloberg that you see in the immediate foreground. And then in the distance, you can see Cable Mountain. And then the plot below just shows you the English ship tracks between 1750 and 1854, 
And just to emphasize that the main, or one of the main routes for the British Empire was to the east. And of course, the trade with the east. And at that point, of course, there was no Suez Canal, right? So all ships basically had to, had to round the Cape. So Cape Town as a consequence became a very important strategic uh, position for the British. Now, what's happened since the Industrial Revolution are a number of things, and perhaps graphically the most familiar to us is the increase in atmospheric CO2. Now, CO2 is a trace gas. It's in the parts per million. It originally, at the time of the, prior to the Industrial Revolution, we know that the atmosphere had about 280 parts per million. And that record is shown in the white dots, and that is from the ice core records, okay? Measured from air trapped in the ice. And then from 1958, to the present, we've been able to measure it directly in the atmosphere from the Hawaiian Islands, the remote area of the Pacific. And you can see that we've had this quite literal exponential increase in CO2. And that reflects the fact that we are burning at an incredibly rapid rate fossil fuels, which would include coal, natural gas, petroleum, and those sorts of products. And the burning of those, of course, produces CO2 as a byproduct. And so what we're seeing in this record is this very rapid increase in CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels and has led to a whole series of other consequences that you probably have also heard of, such as global warming. Global warming produces warmer oceans. Warmer oceans expand to a larger volume. And as a consequence, sea level rises. The ocean takes up more CO2, making the ocean more acidic than it was before. And all of these consequences are happening now. And we can measure them. And the other major impact has been what's often referred to as the, as the sixth extinction referring to the fact that Earth in its long history has had five major mass extinction events. And some have proposed that we are currently living in the sixth mass extinction in which over half of the species living on Earth may potentially go extinct, with the estimate currently that one in eight species that are known today are in danger of extinction. So for these reasons, it was proposed, this term, the Anthropocene was proposed to emphasize that humans have become sort of a geological force in their own right. Okay. Hence the name Anthropocene, human epoch. And geologists, of course, for those of you who did any geology at school, you might remember the classic stratigraphic column giving you all the different periods of Earth history, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, the Paleocene, Eocene, and Ligocene, and so forth. These are things that, as students, we had to memorize or learn. So the idea is that we are currently, or we're in the Holocene, the very top there, and that they're proposing this new epic, the Anthropocene. And so, it's not really in the sense of defining, it's been on defining when did the Anthropocene start. And a number of people have said, well, it could be correlated with the start of the sea increase in CO2. Other people have proposed the Trinity first nuclear uh, atomic explosion, test explosion. And there've been a number of proposals for when we could mark the beginning of the Anthropocene. But I think, that misses the main point of the Anthropocene, and that is it's more a call to when it might end, right? Uh, particularly for us. So rather than trying to figure out when, the, when to define the start of the Anthropocene, we should really be concerned about the future and how it might end. So what I wanna do in this talk is sort of give you some sense of 
how the Anthropocene is expressed in the West Coast and what we can do about it. How can we change things to make the world, how can we make the Anthropocene last as long as possible? And I'll start with this image, which shows you a satellite image. Uh, hopefully most of you will recognize it, that St. Helena Bay and Saldana Bay and Longabon Lagoon along the coast, that's Cape Columbine. Between them, you can see the Picketburg as that triangular mountain range and the Cedarburg to, on the far right. And what I want you to appreciate from this photo, which I find quite striking, is the whole mosaic of farms, right? You can see that almost the entire Bowdland area, the coastal plain, has been farmed, which makes sense because this is known as the Swartland. Uh, it's the home of large fields of winter wheat. And because the soil is rich, it's weathered Malmesbury group shales. These provide excellent soils. Uh, there's water available from irrigation from the Berg River system and so forth. So, and look at it, look, and then in contrast to that, you have the sandstone thing boss uh, in the Picketburg and along the Cedarburg Mountains that has been relatively untouched, okay? Because it's difficult, very difficult to farm there. First off, the soils are not very good. And also it's mountainous and rocky and rugged. You're not gonna have a much chance farming there unless you're gonna grow proteas for export or something like that. So the point of this is then that it hopefully shouldn't surprise you by the, statistic, the, the fact that we have altered three quarters of ice-free land on earth and primarily through farming. If not through plowing and growing crops, then having um, herds of cattle or sheep, so forth. So the impact of, of humans on the landscape has been very large in that sense, in the need to grow food to feed so many of us. And I just have up there in the corner the, this sentence here that plants relate to bedrock geology. So we can understand a lot of the original plant communities based on their distribution relative to the underlying rocks. But that's another talk, and it's one of the talks I've given before, and it is on my website, the link there to it. So if you're interested in that topic of how plants relate to the bedrock, you can check that out. So this is the image from Peak and Earth's Cook Pass. Maybe many of you have seen this on the N7. <clears throat> Looking to the west, you can see there's the Swartland, you can see all the crops. Uh, and across to the Picketburg, which is dominated by the quartz sandstone rocks and the Thaneboss community, which is, as I mentioned, relatively pristine. And it's these low-lying, clay-rich, weathered Malmesbury's that are rocks that are heavily weathered. So one of the efforts to try to help conserve essentially what remains, to help try to prevent any more extinctions than, than have to occur from human activity. <laughs> One idea is around um, biodiversity, retaining biodiversity, the abundance of different life forms. And one way to do that, of course, is to make reserves, right? Nature reserves and national parks. And then the other effort is around trying to construct conservation corridors, which link these. So a good example is this one, which is just to the north of the area I showed you previously. There's St. Helena Bay at the bottom, um, and it goes up through um, the Oldefons River Valley, up through Sittestall and Clan William, Devon Reinsdorf, Newboatville, so forth. And the effort here is to try to connect coastal communities of Elons Bay, St. Helena Bay, uh, to the east over to the Cedarburg, and then to the Great Escarpment. And that would be sort of your east-west component. And then the north-south component runs from the Picketburg area all the way up to the New York. And the idea is to try to provide land that's maybe not completely undeveloped, but at least minimally developed and minimally dissected by roads and fences and canals and whatever, 
to allow for plants and animals and insects to freely move through those corridors. So that's the idea. The other <clears throat> way which humans, of course, have impacted is through urbanization. Uh, you know, 66% of the Western Cape lives in Cape Town. And that's very typical, right? This draw of people to the city. So uh, certainly before COVID at least, but people were always drawn to cities uh, for all sorts of reasons. And so cities is of course where you see the most intensive impacts of urbanization. But in some ways urbanization can be viewed as a good thing because it focuses humans in very geographically limited areas, which means that our footprint is a little more restricted. It's a severe footprint, but it's restricted. And that allows for much larger areas to be free of human occupation and um, influence. And cities also tend to be energetically more um, easily to conserve through mass transport and other features like that. But certainly Cape Town has had um, a lot of impact. And one way to, um, to show this is through the bay. So on the far left there, you see a original map from Barrow's description. He was one of the Brits who came here and described the area before they took it. And it, you know, a one who is here, this is his map. And it shows you the original extent of Cable Bay before it was developed. Then over time, they initially developed the um, Albert Basin and the Victoria Basin. And eventually, of course, uh, filled in the southern end of the bay uh, to allow for the building of the foreshore. So the foreshore today, with all of its tall buildings, was purposely infilled to provide for building space because the Cape CBD, that city bowl, had basically filled. Um, and they, they did that by dredging uh, sediment out of the bay to form the, the docks uh, to the north. And they also dredged reef clay, which is the wetland uh, to the north there above the Salt River. Uh, and deep river mountains. So this is an example of pretty major reconfiguration of a major feature like a bay. And it's very typical of large cities on the, on the coast. So San Francisco is another very good example where the much of San Francisco Bay Area has been infilled to allow for building because the land is so uh, much in need. And of course, to do this building, we need earth materials. So this is a photo uh, from that stove of the aggregate mine up in the Tigerberg. You see them, there's a satellite image there on the lower left. You see these, I see them when I fly to Joburg, the plane goes over the Tigerberg. If you look out the window, you see these big, huge holes, or sorry, pits in the ground. And so those are being actively uh, excavated. And of course, that aggregate is used to make concrete. And there's an example of polished concrete there showing you the dark little fragments of Malmesbury shale that have been baked by the granite and made more hard and are used as road energy as well. So when you drive on the asphalt and you see all those little rocks, in it, most of it is rock, those are all coming from these sorts of pits. So major excavations, changing of landscapes to build up the city. Urban environments also, of course, vary quite significantly. So, for example, this is a, in the lower left, there is a photo looking from Devil's Peak area, looking to the north. You can see the tiger bird in the distance. And the white outline is the suburb of Pinelands, actually where I live. It was the first garden city and was um, specifically developed around the ideas of how, uh, Ebenezer Howard in the UK to try to make more pleasant environments for people to live and work. And the rectangle next to it that you see there on is the cemetery, the Maitland Cemetery. Very well fertilized trees that are growing there for a long time as in violence. And so what you get, you can see they form these basically urban uh, woodlands, of which like Johannesburg is another good example. They're all mostly alien trees, of course, very few indigenous trees. 
but a lot of trees nonetheless. And so they create a, different, a new environment that didn't exist there before. What used to exist there was the Cape Lowland Acid Fame Boss, which has now essentially been completely obliterated outside of the uh, Monobosch Common and the Kenilworth Racecourse. Um, but of course, there are other environments, other city environments, like the one to the north of Highlands of Carrow, which is a semi-industrialized uh, area, and you'd be hard pressed to hard, you'd hardly find a single tree there, let alone a, a woodland. So there's a lot of variations in terms of the environments. And if we look at the um, Cape Town greater area on the far left, it shows you the, in colors there, different colors, the, the plant communities that grew there prior to farming, okay? And you can see that there's large areas of coastal dunes, Franfeld, there's the lowland acid cane balls I mentioned before in green, and there is the uh, rhinocerous in purple, and so forth. And then if you look at the middle diagram, you can see that essentially most of those lowland plant communities have been wiped out. There are little pockets of them that remain, but basically wiped out. The ones that have fared the best, as I mentioned before, in the Cape Peninsula and in the Cape Cold Belt, where you have these rugged sandstone mountains that are relatively well preserved. The image on the, on the far right there is trying to show you where they survived the idea of these corridors to try to link these little fragmentary bits that remain to allow for the movement and um, of animals and, and plants and insects and all that. And there where the red circle is on that one, I just wanna show you that's the Blauberg conservation area, just to show you as an example. Uh, it's the one you can visit to see the Battle of Blauberg site. And uh, what you have there in that area is a huge infestation of uh, Port Jackson, which you see there in the upper left. So it's basically just been completely taken over by that. And that conservation group is working hard at taking them out and trying to get the indigenous plants uh, back in place. Um, and that's just one example of the candelabra flower, a uh, beautiful flower that blooms in that area. And then the, the lower left is the image from the top of Bloberg looking out to the sea. So they're trying to link corridors from the coastal system right the way through to Bloberg, the hill, and then through to the other side of that hill. Uh, and I think they're having good success, but it's, it's a very difficult job to get rid of those Port Jacks because they are so heavily seeded uh, and growing there. In fact, I forgot to mention, uh, what they do is they have brought in the gall forming rust fungus, which helps reduce the number of seeds. So the fecundity of those uh, plants is reduced, but it's still a tremendous amount of work to get them under control. And then somewhat controversial in Cape Town is the notion of replacing the find plantations to bring them back to the indigenous flora. And here is an example from the Takai Forest. Maybe many of you have been there and walked. And it just shows you the strong contrast. In the foreground, you have many, many different species of, again, the lowland Cape fame boss community of plants. Not very many trees in that, hardly any trees at all, in fact, uh, mostly a shrubland. But then the sharp contrast with the more or less monospecific, a single species of pine tree that they're growing for commercial uh, reasons. And one of the ideas around returning to the thing boss is it's naturally adapted to water stressed environments. And the Working for Water program has been pushing to replace the alien tree plantations and forests with these more natural indigenous plants because they transpire far less water into the atmosphere. So the amount of water that the trees are pumping out is probably an order of magnitude more than the amount of water on those adjacent plants. It's controversial because people, especially from the Northern Hemisphere like myself, we're so used to trees. We want trees, we like forests. 
But this place was never really meant to have forests outside the Athamon Green Forest. And it was meant to have these very diverse uh, shrubs. So there's sort of a, uh, uh, perhaps a bit of back and forth on that, but the push is to try to reclaim these areas that have been lost. And for water, that's important because many of us know the West Coast, and I should say, including that, the South Coast here, is, uh, can be water stressed. And the West Coast in particular is water stressed because it is on the seasonal cycle of rainfall, right? So we get most of the rain occurs in winter, as you know, and you can see on that image on the left, the dark blue are the main areas in which rainfall occurs. And that is in the high mountainous areas. And very quickly, as you move away from those areas, precipitation drops off and it becomes very dry. So that seasonality of rainfall and it's very much focused fall within the mountains makes it difficult for us to have enough water. And globally, water, fresh water is a problem with only one in nine people really having access to it, or one in nine people not having access to it. And this leads to all sorts of issues around health and well being. So, in the case of the Western Cape, uh, this diagram is a little bit busy, but I'll just take you through it. In the lower diagram is a long term record of rainfall in the Cape. And you can see that that dates back to um, 1860 or so and runs right the way through to the present day. And the main point about that is our rainfall is variable. There's nothing constant about it, right? So you go up and down, up and down. And there are number of periods of drought which are labeled there. And then the diagram above it tries to blow up the most recent drought. Okay, so uh, that would be from about 2008 to 2020. And you can see there the rainfall, the dark blue, or sorry, in the red, we have a series of low winter rainfall, uh, several, two, three years in a row. And then the dark blue shows you the dam storage. And the dam storage, of course, drops and drops and drops, and we're all panicking about when the taps are gonna go dry. And then very fortunately, after the third year of low rainfall, we had a decent rainfall. And now the dams, as you know, are all full. But the point being that we are susceptible, we're vulnerable to those periods of multiple years of low winter rainfall. And whether global warming will intensify those or not is debatable, but it's certainly um, a possibility that that could have an impact. So, what are, what are our other options for water besides rainfall? Well, we can try to tap what's called groundwater, which is water within the rocks. Um, and the way that works is this is a geological cross-section through the Cedarburg Mountains. So it's as if you took a big cake knife and you cut it down the middle and you looked at it sideways. And what you, I want you to appreciate there is you've got these large fold structures. And the blue rock there is the sandstone rock, and it's highly fractured, full of fractures, which can fill with water to make it what's called an aquifer, a water-bearing rock. And so that extends up into the high cedarberg, the cedarberg is shown there, and it goes down into these troughs, such as in, under the Oliphant River Valley. And when it rains in the winter up in those mountains, that rainfall, much of it, is captured by seepage into those rock cracks. And as it goes into those rock cracks, it, the flow slows hugely. So it can take tens, hundreds, even thousands of years for that winter rain to work its way down into that trough and eventually come back up to feed the Oliphant River. Where you have something like a fault, you can get the deeper waters to arrive at the surface very quickly and that's how you get a hydrothermal uh, thermal springs like at the baths near Citrus Gulf, if you've been there. So one idea then is to extract this natural reservoir, kind of an underground dam, if you like, 
of water. And there's a borehole at Citrusdal, for example, that's been in operation for many years. And they do just that. They extract borehole water uh, as do many, many farmers. The drawback to this is if you have a long-term drought and you rely heavily on boreholes, you can, of course, run them dry. So it's not an inexhaustible supply of water. It has its limits. And you can, of course, negatively impact springs that natural ecosystems depend on. Now, during the Cape Town drought, the height of it, there was a suggestion, and I found it quite intriguing, and that is the possibility of harvesting fresh water from icebergs by towing them here. And basically taking the melt water and pumping it on shore. Now, <clears throat> um, the thing to realize is that most of Earth's fresh water is actually retained within ice. And we just happen to have the world's largest ice cube in south of it, right? Antarctica, huge. If all of that ice on Antarctica were to melt, global sea level would rise by 60 to 65. That goes to show you just how much water is in ice. And of course, ice is pure water because it's from evaporation of water in the ocean. So the idea is that Antarctica is constantly pumping out icebergs into the sea and that some of them reach far enough north up towards the Gulf Island area, that if you, and they measure by about a kilometer by half a kilometer in size, they're called tabular icebergs, and they have a depth of about 250 meters. And the idea is you could wrap them in sort of a textile, geotextile skirting, and then use tankers and tugboats to basically move this thing, steer it to where you want it to go. And you might see there, you've got very complex currents around Southern Africa through the Cape, what's called the Cape Colton. But you can monitor these by satellite and you can basically tell the ships how to steer it through using the current to eventually end up at say Soldana Bay. And you could park it offshore there and then pump the water offshore. So it sounds a bit outrageous, a bit far-fetched, but I think uh, the engineers say it's doable and there's companies who are willing to fund it, to try it. And um, we'll see. Didn't happen obviously this time, but it might happen in the future as an option. Because the other, the other feature uh, about the sea level, now of course sea level is gonna change a lot if that Antarctic iceberg ice sheet melts 60 to 65 meters, which is a lot. That will drown the Cape Flats. That'll make the Cape Peninsula a couple of islands that exist offshore. But it takes a tremendous amount of time to melt that much ice. So that's probably not going to happen anytime too quick. What's happening more quickly is that the warming of the atmosphere is warming the ocean, which is causing it to expand. And as the ocean expands, the sea level rises. And you can see a plot of that up there in the upper left showing you the tide gauge and satellite data showing the rising sea level. And if you go to Bloberg Beach, which is the photo that that's superimposed on, you can see active coastal erosion today. Okay. So coastal erosion is already a problem and it's just gonna get worse as sea level continues to rise and storm intensity increases from global warming. And then finally the image there on the lower right is showing you a projected modeling of four degrees C warming, a rise in sea level. And there you see in Finland, I might have ocean property. I'm lucky, I just had to see if I could get that just right, so. And of course, as I mentioned, sea level changes are nothing new. And geologically, we know that sea level has changed tremendously. So this diagram shows you the topography onshore, and then offshore it shows you the bathymetry, the water depth. And you see the solid white line. That is the strand line where the beach was just 18,000 years ago. And I hope it impresses on you how much the shoreland has changed in that relatively short period of time. And in particular, if you consider where Hermanus is, 
there, Walker Bay, you can see that the shoreline extended all the way, you know, hundreds of kilometers offshore. And that was all exposed land. So that the Breeder River Valley would have carried on from uh, near De Hoop and would have gone right the way down to the south. And that would have been huge coastal plains. So it's really quite dramatic how much sea level has changed in the past. And we know what drives that. It is driven by global climate change. In this case, the buildup of ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere, when much of North America and portions of Europe were covered with ice, that was enough water removed to lower sea level by 130 meters. And then, of course, that ice in the Northern Hemisphere melted and the sea level rose to its current position. So we know from Earth history that the sea is constantly going up and down. It's related to global climate and that um, these changes are in response to a general uh, global mean temperature change of five degrees Celsius. And as you may have read, we've already produced about a one to one and a half degree change increase and a projected change of between three, four, maybe up to five degrees in the next century. So, but what's interesting is, although we know what happens if we were gonna make the globe five degrees colder, if that was the problem, then we would know we'd go into another ice age, another glacial, or the ice sheets growing in the north. But, and we know, we know that if we were in an ice age glacial and we rose it by five degrees, we'd go to where we are today. But what we don't know is what happens when we're in already a warm, relatively warm period today, and we add another five degrees, then what happens? And that we don't know. And that's the uncertainty uh, of the future and that threat of that uh, higher CO2. So what can we do to minimize the increase in CO2? Well, we can have other alternative sources of energy. And Kuberg nuclear power station is one. It uses uranium, doesn't have any CO2 emissions. Um, and about 5% of our electricity nationally comes from this one nuclear power station. It's the only one in Africa. Okay? Um, and it's old, but it's still cranking along. And all of one of the major issues, of course, of nuclear power is what to do with nuclear waste, which has not really been resolved. But in the meantime, it's simply stored on site. Okay, in the case of Hoover. So that people have proposed is not generally a good long-term solution for our energy needs, but could certainly be important in getting us to the point of where we allow things like solar and wind to be sufficient to meet our energy needs. So that's a solar panel field in series uh, basin. You've probably seen those around, of course, and then the wind turbine. And all those, that's the critical wind farm, the top of Peru. And these, of course, are renewable energies. They don't produce CO2, and they are hopefully going to start to increase in importance in supplying our energy needs. And we can start to curtail, uh, hopefully rapidly, the amount of CO2 we use currently. So uh, those are challenges in the future. And then just to mention, we know that change on the West Coast is nothing new. And to get a sense of how much different the West Coast was five million years ago, you can visit the West Coast Fossil Park, which I highly recommend if you haven't been there. Beautiful displays of all the animals that used to live on the West Coast that are now extinct, not because of humans. They just naturally went extinct. That's the thing about life. Most things do go extinct eventually. So you had short-necked giraffes called cynotheres, you had elephants uh, called uh, gomphotheres, and you had Africa's only known bear. There's fossils of a bear at that uh, fossil site that is only known from that one site in the whole African continent. So it's very interesting. And of course, more recently, historically, we know humans have impacted um, the survival of some of the larger animals. The uh, quokka and the blue antelope both went extinct historically in the last several uh, hundred years, a couple hundred years. 
And that was uh, probably because they were maybe already in low numbers. They were uh, hunted, they were wanted for zoos, so forth, uh, and they both went extinct. But there are good uh, scenarios for the, for example, the Bonte Bach there in the lower center and the Cape Leopard have managed to survive. The Bonte Bach through farming efforts, as you probably know, associated in the area of the Bonte Bach National Park uh, near Swelling Dam. And the Cape Leopard is able to survive because it lives in such remote areas that it's very difficult uh, to, to get to it in terms of the farmers uh, who are trapping it or poisoning it, whatever, they have managed to survive. And things like the Elon, of course, were hunted uh, on horseback and by rifle, but because they were already weary of humans, they knew to avoid humans, they have managed to survive uh, relatively well, at least in other areas, and they have now been re-imported to national parks on the West Coast. And then if we look to the ocean, I'll just use an example of whales and Siam and Manus. <laughs> and, um, you know, whales, the kind of interesting history there in terms of over exploitation, you can see that his, before whaling was initiated, there were a lot of whales. Uh, the plot here is from Charlie Griffiths uh, at UCT, and he's estimated there, there were probably over 70,000 southern right whales prior to uh, whaling. And you can see the precipitous drop in the numbers as whaling took off and uh, huge numbers of whales were of course harvested. And it reached a critical level of less than a thousand for quite a while. Um, and eventually of course, whaling was largely prohibited um, and the numbers have managed to rebound, uh, still a lot fewer than there were, but it's encouraging to see that they're coming back. Although I do hear recent reports that they are uh, suffering from um, not getting enough food from the krill feeding grounds that for whatever reasons that aren't entirely clear, uh, they're not getting enough food to necessarily be healthy enough to breed and uh, raise successful new generations. So uh, the story on the southern right whale is still open, but it looks encouraging since the ban that their numbers have at least started to increase. So just to wrap up then, uh, in terms of this concept of what's often referred to as the new human ecology, okay? uh, humans, uh, through our exploitation of the land and the sea to feed ourselves and to maintain the large numbers like populations have had this huge impact. And it's clear that we're going to need to adapt to this new world. And I just show this slide as, I guess, maybe an example of some of that adaptation. It's from the Darling area. And in the distance there, you can see the Darling Hills, which are granite. And the very tops of the most distant hills are not farmed because they have rocky outcrop. Uh, and then the middle section of those hills is farmed. There's canola and winter wheat and so forth. There's a farmhouse that's very bucolic. It looks lovely. After all, we like to eat and we need our food. So we do need to grow food. There's no question about that. But um, in the foreground there is the Thiefersfeld Reserve, which is small, but it's critical because it's in these lowland areas that are so easily farmed and so um, historically farmed that it's rare to find pieces that have been preserved. And so this reserve um, contains many indigenous flowering plants. This is in spring. It's a beautiful spot to go in spring. And it's helping to conserve them, even though it's a relatively small piece of land. So the hilltops are perhaps have some remaining indigenous plants because they've only been grazed. They have been plowed. The middle part has been pretty much wiped out. And then some of the lowland areas have been conserved. So I think in adapting to this new human ecology,
we acknowledge that humans have had this large impact, but we also acknowledge that humans have to make an effort to conserve and protect what remains, because that, after all, that's in our, our own self-interest for survival. So hopefully with the West Coast uh, is, a, is an ex a local example of this global need to become more aware of these environments and to do what we can to facilitate the survival of at least the majority of, of those organisms that are out there. Probably are, it's too late for many of them. It's probably gonna mean we're gonna have to pick our battles in terms of what can survive. But it's very important, of course, that we try. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. Want, uh, I may have to repeat your questions because of the Zoom. Is it the arrival of industrial man that actually precipitated the problems that we are facing now? Uh, yeah, and we, we could blame the British for that. <laughs> There's so many things to blame the British for, I suppose. But the, um, I think the thing you learn from uh, the sort of deeper history uh, things like the invention of control of fire or stone tools or any, any human invention you want to think about is that, or farming, the invention of farming, right, about 10,000 years ago. Um, there's not a lot of options for people to say, ah, not interested, thanks, but no thanks. Because, of course, it becomes a global phenomenon. So farming initiated in areas outside of Africa, and then of course eventually spread to Africa. And Africa is kind of unique in this sense that it's one of the few places in the world where we still have the survival of hunter-gatherer groups, if just barely, like the Sa. Mm. So there are still hunter-gatherers that may have managed to survive the, the, the farming, event of farming, but very few. And consequently, with, you know, Industrial Revolution, there might have been farmers that said, hey, we're not interested in the Industrial Revolution. We don't want any part of it, but they'll be very hard pressed to survive. So the thing about these major events, inventions, control of fire, farming, domestication of, you know, animals, and then the Industrial Revolution, is that they're hard to... Uh, avoid and they tend to be global and of course what the British were very good at not only in develop in sort of the origination of the industrial revolution I mean I'm sure someone else would have done it if they hadn't eventually but they were then very good at um, globalizing it by that map I showed you of the routes of their ships through trade and and you know when the Dutch came here it was really actually it was really the uh, multinational corporations refreshment station, right? They weren't particularly interested in developing empire, really. They wanted to just have a space that they could conveniently use in terms of their trade to the East. The British, when they came, they came with empire, yeah. you know, and they built railroad, railroads, they built mountain passes, they built schools, they built presses, they, all that stuff. They came with all of that. And so, yeah, we've, that's all been part of our history. To just summarize, yeah, what Bob Hill is asking is whether the, the Professor Compton discerns any change in attitude on the part of people that are dealing with these issues towards the, the urgency and the need to change our, our attitudes and change up those processes in order to prevent or forestall some of the events which are forecast on the basis of research such as yours? I can happily say that yes, I have seen uh, concerted efforts. And I think as an example, a fairly local example would be the Elgin Basin, which of course is that rather highland basin between the two passes that I came over to get here today. A beautiful uh, high raised valley where they, of course they grow apples and wine and so forth, as you know. And there is a, um, a farmer's collective group there that's very interested in conservation. And I think farmers know the land, they know their plants, they know their bees and their insects, everything. 
they uh, recognize the importance of the more sort of holistic understanding of their their land and, and how they make a living. So I'm very encouraged by that. It's, and I spoke to them now, maybe it was four years ago, but I know that there the farmers are willing to set aside arable land for return of natural ecosystems and particularly around strips and corridor concepts. So the mountains itself that surround Elgin are pretty pristine, as I mentioned before. It's the lowland area where the, all the productive farms are. And there you have to convince farmers to sacrifice part of that land in hopefully a well thought out way of connecting corridors to enhance the sustainability. And I think there are groups um, that are very keen on that. Bloberg uh, Conservation Area doesn't really have that many farmers in it, but a place like Elgin has a lot of farmers and they are quite active in trying to, uh, I think it's largely purely voluntary and just you know an agreement that this needs to be done. This needs to happen. A, a comment, a comment from, the, from the audience in the hall that I'll just repeat. It's not the farmers that are the problem, it's us urban dwellers that are, that are continuously appropriating land for purposes inconsistent with conservation. John Gertje, I'm going to ask a question. Is CO2 in fact the most important and the only greenhouse gas? Aren't there other things that we also should be concerned about? Yes, there are other uh, greenhouse gases. Um, mm one of which would be methane, natural gas, CH4, which is even more of a trace gas than CO2, but a much stronger greenhouse gas. And of course, the most common greenhouse gas, the most abundant one is water vapor. Okay? So water is a greenhouse gas. And what happens is it kind of leads to what's called a positive feedback loop, right? So you get, um, warmer temperatures and warmer temperatures evaporate more water. More water in the atmosphere can trap more heat. So there are other, many other, there are, and then there's, but certainly CO2 through the burning of greenhouse gas, uh, through, through the burning of fossil fuels has been the main, the main contributor to warming. Yeah, so uh, another source of CO2 is through making of cement which happens on the west coast of course uh, the various mines where they are mining limestone or marble and cooking it to make cement the way you make cement is you take seashells or you take limestone and you heat it to 900 celsius and it drives off the co2 and you end up with calcium oxide or lime which is made which you make cement with so that you're to making it you drive the co2 back off the end that's about 7% annually of the total anthropogenic or human produced CO2 flux is from making a cement. So certainly in South Africa, we appreciate that because most of our homes are masonry and we use cement, we use a lot of cement. And you go to some of these mega cities and of course you see the huge amount of cement. So cement is huge. I'm in the chat box. If an iceberg is towed to the coast, how exactly would it then be processed to provide water for human use? Okay, good question. My understanding is, now remember the iceberg, remember you only see the tip of the iceberg, right? So that tabular ice sheet or berg that breaks off has about, it's about 25, 30 meters above sea level that's exposed. So if only 10%, that means it has a total depth of about 250 meters, okay? Now, one of the problems, if you remember the map I showed you of the bathymetry, the water depth, is you would say, well, wait a minute, how close can you even get that to shore? Because 250 meters, you're gonna have to park it way, way offshore. But you may have noticed along the West Coast, they have a very deep cut canyon called the Cape Canyon which cuts right from Cape Columbine, right offshore. And it goes right by Saldana Bay. So the idea would be to park this 
iceberg in that canyon where the 250 meter water depth is quite close to shore, maybe within 50, meet, 50 kilometers of Saldana. And then the idea is once you park it in the canyon, is you just extract the meltwater, you mine the meltwater, and you pump that to shore, to Saldana, and then from there to the city of Cape. And apparently one of the big issues around doing that is the water is just above freezing. It's at freezing or just above, and apparently it's a plumbing issue of handling very cold water, which I don't totally understand, but apparently that's one of the issues. And of course, the other issue is a lot of the iceberg, of course, is gonna melt into the sea. You're not gonna harvest the whole thing, right? Because now you've parked it in water that, okay, the West Coast water is fairly chilly, maybe 13 degrees, 14 degrees, but it's gonna melt. So what's the impact of that gonna be in the local marine environment? And that would have to be. But if you wanna desalinate, you have the opposite problem. What do you do with all the salt brine? Where do you dump that? It's also very potentially damaging. So there's all those sort of issues to figure out. Yeah, I think we'll leave it at that then. John, on behalf of U3A, thank you very much for the most interesting and thought-provoking talk. Uh, there are a number of issues which are of obvious concern to, our, to us here, living here. Uh, we are fundamentally now dependent on our water aquifer. If that were taken away, we would be in permanent water rationing. And not water shortage, water rationing. Mm -hmm. We already, in that sense, entered the, the aquifer uh, tapping age mm -hmm. in, in, in Hermanus. And so that's obviously of great concern to us. Would you touch on a large number of other points of more general concern? And thank you very much. And thank you for taking the trouble to come from Cape Town and speak to us this morning.